May I thank Jnuta for inviting me to speak here this afternoon. Um, thank you very much indeed. It's that would be very kind. Thank you very much indeed for the invitation. Um, I belong to a period where there was no Junuta, so I'm particularly happy that I was invited today. Looking round the hall, I must confess that I have a feeling that I'm here as a dinosaur. <laughs> And therefore, I'm going to speak like a dinosaur. <laughs> I'm going to talk not about what the JNU is today, of which I am very proud of many, many things, but I'm going to talk about some of the issues and problems that we face when we started it off. So bear with me, it's very much an old person's view of something that is still ongoing. Now, in talking about the life of a university, we have to keep in mind the fact of knowing what is the purpose of education. And I would say that the purpose of education is to ask, to learn to ask relevant questions. Questioning is absolutely fundamental to anything that has to do with education. To question existing knowledge and check whether it is up to date, because only by doing that can we make advances in knowledge and have these appreciated by all those that know something about what is being discussed. And to use that knowledge purposefully to enhance existing knowledge and to understand better how we have arrived at the present, and what does the present actually mean. This is something that most of us don't really understand, and we should be understanding. And that's very, very important. This, unfortunately, has not been the general approach to education. I mean, in this country, before independence, we were learning by rote and learning what the colonial people told us to learn. And after independence, we were still learning by rote, largely. There were some exceptions. And we were repeating a lot of what was told to us was knowledge without being allowed to question it fully. And that permission is getting darker and darker and less and less accessible to us as we go through time. But the questioning of existing knowledge, I would say, is fundamental to education. And this is something that I would insist on. So JNU started functioning in 1971. And I'd like to pay a small tribute to the first vice chancellor, G. Partha Salati, who had his good points and his bad points, as all vice chancellors have. But the important thing about GP, as we called him, was that he understood education. He understood what the university as an institution is. He understood the functioning of the university in society. Not every vice chancellor understands that. But because he had such a strong academic interest, he also understood the academic problems. So he was the kind of person who would say to us as we sat together and discussed things like uh, uh, making up a course and syllabus and so on, he would say, I do not wish a repetition of any syllabi and course of what already prevails in Indian universities. I want something new, fresh. I want a new understanding of knowledge. And he was very insistent on that, and he emphasized interdisciplinary research, which is one of the things that we uh, did pick up and, and, and develop. And so initially, we were given the winter semester off, completely off. What for? We had to sit down and brainstorm and work out courses. 
and meaningless and silver. So this meant intensive discussion. Fortunately, in, in our center, the history center, the early recruits of the faculty were all very bright historians. And I must confess that it was, as it began, it was an intellectual challenge to be with people with whom you would put out an idea and say, I think we should teach this, and they would turn around and say, what rubbish? Do you realize what this means? And then they'd tear it to bits, and we'd start all over again. It was a very, very intensive brainstorming that we went through uh, in the, that early semester of 1971, and I'm very grateful for it, because we cleared out a lot of mess and got to the point much more easily. Um, the point about drafting courses at that stage was that, of course, we were not observing the year-long system. We were not doing a BA course that went from July to April and had an exam at the end. We had a semester system. Now remember a semester system 50 odd years ago was something very new. And people kept sitting around and saying, what is a semester? What does it mean? And look, some of us had the experience of teaching in universities abroad that had semesters, others didn't. And so that was part of working out what it meant. And what we meant by it was that you take up a question, an academic question in your subject, and you cover it in that semester. And what, what do I mean by covering it? You asked questions of it. You went through the existing information on it and the existing knowledge on it. And then you said, right, now how do we explore this further? What are the directions we can go in? And you took up those directions and you began to ask questions. And the course then was very much concerned with gathering the information that exists, but asking questions of that information. And, and that really was an important, very important aspect of the semester system. Um, teaching was by lectures, of course, supplemented by tutorials. And the tutorials were great because, you know, some of us had a little experience of tutorials, most didn't. So we had to even sit down and work out what do we mean by a tutorial? What do we do with a tutorial? How do we get students to write? And then what is the discussion in the tutorial to consist of? I mean, these are all questions that we take for granted now. Nobody even asks them. But remember when there wasn't this system, no university had tutorials. And we were the first who stood up and said, no, no, every coursework has to have two tutorials per semester. This again was very new and made us think. It was as much of a, a bind, as it were, on the faculty as it was on the students. The students kept saying, but this is not how we've been taught elsewhere. And the faculty had to think afresh about what are the questions that you have to ask, what are the topics that each of your semesters are um, dealing with. So our courses were very different. We were, in fact, exploring ideas. And that exploration is important. History, for example, if I can spend two minutes on that, it had moved from being part of what was called Indology to becoming a social science. This was a huge step, and very few, few people understood what this meant, even historians. We had to work out in great detail what do we mean. Indology means a narrative about the Indian past, history as Indology. Very simple. You started the year by saying, this is the period we're going to study, these are the books you have to read, and then the story went on and on and on and on about people and events and what happened till you came to March when you stopped teaching and you gave them time, the students time to prepare for the exam. Now, instead of that, what you got now was, say, not a continuous narrative from beginning to end, but topics and problems that were picked out, and students were being taught how to discuss them, how to write about them, how to research them. 
even more important. Um, when I say topics that were picked out, I don't mean random topics. There was a framework within which each specialization worked out its, its topics. And what was its procedure that we adopted? We were assessing, first of all, very important and particularly important today. Unfortunately, we live at a time in this country when evidence is simply not taken seriously. Nobody asks for evidence. You can get up and talk utter rubbish and say, I believe it. And no one is going to say, what is your evidence? So we started off with teaching students about evidence and how important it is. And more than that, how do you test the reliability of evidence? Because not every statement you make is evidence. You have to test the reliability and prove its reliability. The emphasis then was on professional methods of training scholars in a discipline. Terribly important. And that's precisely what we suffer from today. There is, particularly in a discipline like history, a frontal confrontation between the professionally trained historian who tests the reliability of evidence, the generalizations that are being made, the statements that follow, with a whole bunch of people who have no idea what the evidence is, or if they've read it, they've read it in translation, in some wretched author translation, which is not reliable and who then proceed to make statements about that particular subject uh, with really no evidence and no knowledge. And this is, this is, I think, one of the crises in both education and in our intellectual life today. You cannot have <coughs> rampant, non-evidence, non-reliable statements being made and being treated as serious statements that have to be discussed. This is a crisis that we are facing and which we have to find a way out of. And obviously this conflict will remain and will continue until education improves to the point of people realizing the centrality and the crucial basis of the reliability of the evidence that you turn to. And in all this, therefore, we as academics were very protective of one foundational idea, our right to think freely. Because if you're going to question knowledge, and if you're going to say that, you know, we are going to question the reliability of evidence and prove whether it is it is uh, reliable or not, and all the other questions that follow, you have to protect your right to think freely and not be forced to think in particular ways. So, what did this mean? That we had to discuss all that the students wish to discuss. And the difference was that in our lectures, for example, in Jane, we began all our courses by saying to the students, whilst I am speaking, if there is anything that you A, do not understand, or B, you disagree with, please stop me and we will discuss it. And this is true of everybody that taught, um, certainly true of the History Center Center that I know. And so there was this constant emphasis on, if I don't understand, I can discuss it. If I don't agree, I can discuss it. Discussion, going back and forth and, and, and talking about this. Um, and remember, of course, that the special character of a university is not that you're taking degrees at the level of the BA and the MA, and you're doing PhDs and so on. The special character of a university is it is the one location and the one period in your life as students, as we have all been, where the independence of thought has to be free and primary. 
This is absolutely essential. You will not get it again in your life because you become teachers, you will have to follow a curriculum, you will have to read a particular syllabus. There will be all kinds of pressures of you can do this, but you can't do this, you can say this, but you can't say this, and we're in the thick of it at the moment. Um, do remember that the university period in your life is exceptional because it is the only period where if you are in a proper and good university, you are allowed to think freely. Very important. All right, that was one big issue that we debated and discussed and went over backwards and forwards and so on. Um, and really, it was intellectually very challenging. I may be going on repeating myself, but that was the exciting thing about being in JNU. You really were putting out ideas, fighting those ideas, fighting against those ideas sometimes when you realize they didn't work. And that level of debate, whether it was in the classroom or whether it was in the Ganga Dhaba, it was fundamental to the whole process. The second major issue on which I'll speak shortly, because I'm sure that the others will speak on it, was, and, and where JNU differed quite substantially from other universities for the time, was student recruitment. We were determined to be open to a category of students who otherwise, for socioeconomic reasons, didn't have access to university. And this was really terribly important. Again, something which the first vice chancellor underlined and emphasized and said, please do think of ways in which we can attract a different kind of student body as well as the student body that we will attract normally. Um, so, you know, you didn't have entrance exams with objective type questions and that kind of thing. <laughs> you had to discuss your problem. And at the interview, you were asked, what did you write? Why did you write this? What does it mean that you wrote this? Do you understand it? This, this, is, this is how you test the quality of a student. Not by saying, you know, did uh, Akbar rule in the 15th century or the 18th century or the 19th century. That's not it. Anyway, so that was a big issue, widely debated. Um, and initially, a small concession was worked out for underprivileged students, and it was applied in the first decade until one began to see faults. Now the big thing about Jane was that when we discovered that something wasn't working, we all sat together and said, how can we change it and make it work? I mean, we may not have been able to solve the problem completely, but we were ready to make the changes that would make the problem much easier. So we tried another system, and it seemed to work in the beginning, and then that threw up problems as well. And one must remember that in all these structures within an institution like the university, you cannot have systems that are permanent and unshakable. Remember that a university reflects a changing society. And the first principle about a changing society is how much of the institutions of that society also undergo change. And this is right down to admission processes, examination processes in universities. Um, there were many students who came with little preparation, some preparation, but little preparation, and from varied backgrounds. It was a challenge to teach a mixed class. Believe you me, it's not easy at all. Um, a couple of us in the History Center, for example, did work out something which was a one-year preparatory course, which would bring students up to date more with thinking and ideas and concepts, which were the, the basics of the lacunae in their education. The students rejected it outright. We don't want to spend an extra year, they said although everything was guaranteed to the students, hostel, food, this, that. It was a free one year, but no, we don't want it, so we gave it up. 
And I'm not sure whether, in fact, one shouldn't bring that up again and discuss the possibility that for those students that feel like it, for example, you have a student from the science stream that doesn't know anything at all about history and sociology. Wouldn't it have a little period of preparatory work and get used to understanding at least the concepts that come up in these different disciplines? It's, it's something worth, worth considering. Um, what was very impressive throughout that period on discussion, both of coursework as well as uh, the students that came in, was that there was a lot of talk between students and faculty. We really did get down to brass tacks day in and day out and discuss each other's problems very, very fully. I remember the Gerauls. They were great, I thought. I mean, we were all Gerau turn by turn uh, because there was this demand from the students, and if the demand was not met, then, you know, there would be more trouble and so on. Of course, there was never more trouble, but there was a Gerau. And my most favorite Gerau, I remember, was when we were all sitting together. I think there were about 15 or 20 students, and then there was uh, some admission demand, I think, and then I kept saying, well, you know, let's discuss it. No, 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 we want it. We want it right now. No discussion. We want it. And what did the Gerau end up with? It ended up with my ordering endless cups of tea and all of us discussing the tutorials of that week. It was a lovely chance to sit quietly and just go on talking about what I was teaching and what they were learning and was it getting anywhere. So remember that this process of students and faculty sitting together and talking fully and openly is an extremely important process. And it's something that JNU was known for, and I think it was something that did contribute to the success of what we taught and how we taught. But there's one obvious problem as well in admission and teaching both these questions. And that is the problem of language. We felt it then, we tried to get around it by taking extra classes, extra teaching and so on. But it has continued. In fact, it has, in a sense, uh, become a deeper problem simply because the general educational policy has not seriously tackled the problem of the, the medium of instruction. Um, this will be increasingly difficult unless we find a way of solving this. And the way cannot be the easy political way. Somebody gets up and says, let's have X as a national language. And you have a little discussion on that, and then you clear out, and all right, X becomes the national language. It seems to me that we have to consider other possibilities, like, for example, bilingualism. From school up, you're taught in two languages. It's not a great chore once you begin doing it. It means, yes, they will treat your teachers have to be proficient in two languages, and that's very often the problem. And the students have to be proficient in two languages. Proficient meaning that they have to initially at school stage understand, and then gradually they're trained. And as they go up and up and up into other, other systems, they begin to see the overlap, the interconnections, and so on, of the two languages. What I'm trying to suggest is I'm not providing solutions. But what I'm trying to suggest is that we have to be open about this issue. It's a very fundamental issue, more fundamental than most people realize. And we have to debate it and debate it till the cows come home. As the sewing, and not just the 14th of February. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is an absolutely fundamental issue, and please, Let's make a storm about it in terms of saying we want more discussion on the question of how you use language for education. Because remember one thing that people forget. 
that whether it's Hindi or English or Bengali or Marathi or, or Malayalam or Tamil, different disciplines are more advanced in different languages depending on who is studying them and who is researching them. So there has to be a certain amount of play, give and take, in what discipline are you doing, what is the area you're researching, what is the language most suited to that discipline and that research. It can't be just any old language that comes along. So it is an issue on which I think that, you know, we will have to give much more attention than we have done so far. So let me now, the dinosaur is getting tired, um, let me now finally say that the JNU is a going concern. And despite all the efforts that have been made to dismantle it, it will remain a going concern. And who knows, who knows at the end of the day, we may return back to what we were doing when we first started off. Um, but anyway, that's, that's just a thought. Now, since it came into existence, JNU has been asserting one right, a university right, which I think is very fundamental. The right that extends to every university by the very fact of being a university, being an institution called a university. It's the right to remain in, in a free space for expressing doubts and asking questions. That freedom of space to express doubts and ask questions is the right of the university and it is the right that the university must protect. All this is part of advancing knowledge and therefore improving all our lives, yours and mine. And however difficult this may be, as we have discovered in the past that it is not easy, I feel sure that the JNU will protect this right eventually and that this right will extend to every university. Thank you.